Have you ever wanted to repair something but then realized it would be cheaper to just buy a new one? Have you ever complained about how clothes nowadays are coming apart at the seams? Have you ever wondered where the value of labor went? Have you ever contemplated buying something at a slightly higher price because you're thinking that you're gonna get a better quality product but then it turns out to be just as shitty as the cheaper option? Then this video is for you. But before we get into all of that, we first need to talk about labor hierarchies later stage capitalism and global manufacturing. Content note, this video heavily discusses labor exploitation throughout history, which includes mentions of death, violence, and enslavement. Additionally, all sources for this video are linked in the description. And special thanks to fellow YouTube creators Aisho, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, Lady Knight the Brave, Lola Sebastian, and Ali Sanvia for lending me their amazing voices featured in this video. I couldn't have done it without them. Labor hierarchies have been a staple of many civilizations. Whether based on divine right to rule or some sort of racial science, having an underpaid or wholly uncompensated and quote-unquote disposable workforce is a common pattern throughout human history. Usually this power structure is justified with advancing the species or said civilization and aided with the help of some religious doctrine. But in the end, the only real reason the hierarchy exists is to further the cause of the few rich and powerful people at the top who are benefiting from the labor of the many. As seen in the Pyramid of Capitalist System, a 1911 US cartoon copied from a Russian flyer from 1901, the ruling class sits atop the pyramid and some sort of religious dogma, as well as a well-trained police force and the middlemen bourgeois keep it in place. The priests fool you, the police shoot at you, and the rich eat for you. And the entire pyramid sits atop the laboring masses at the bottom, unnoticed, unappreciated, and yet vital to the entire ecosystem. From the ancient Egyptians, to the Greeks and Romans, to the monarchs of Europe, labor exploitation is a trend that seems to never die out. Well, that and imperialization and colonization. And that's because labor exploitation and imperialism and colonization usually go hand in hand. The people most likely to be subjected under a hierarchy are outsiders or people seen as other, people who are seen as inferior. And these are the same justifications for going in and invading and pillaging and enslaving other groups of people. And I should note here that the term slave in ancient societies is different from how U.S. chattel slavery worked, as that's the type of slavery we use as a frame of reference in contemporary times. For example, according to the Slavery and Servitude article in the UCLA Encyclopedia of Egyptology, slave for Egyptian citizens was a type of occupation and there was upward mobility. One could transcend class status, for example. However, foreign prisoners of war were kept as an exploited class and were sold and bought at slave markets. The documentary evidence is multifaceted. During the Old Kingdom, very large segments of the population were drawn to corvée work, or a form of unpaid forced labor that is intermittent in nature, upward mobility being possible, while foreign prisoners of war were clearly enslaved. Slavery in the legal inherited sense of the term unfolds in Egypt during the Hellenistic period and is based on capture in war, on purchase in the slave market, and on the enslavement of debtors. Additionally, in ancient Greece and Rome, it wasn't a common practice to keep enslaved citizens, but enslaving non-citizen foreigners, such as war prisoners, was common and people could be born into slavery. And as a side note, during my research, I found that a lot of articles about enslavement in ancient times tries to make it sound quote-unquote better than it is. They use words like corvée work or intermittent forced labor to circumnavigate around slavery. They say slaves were similar to serfs, as if that's some sort of win, as if these ancient societies were somehow better than modern society, when that's not necessarily true. Just because you don't enslave your own citizens or the enslavement was similar to serfdom doesn't somehow make slavery or quote-unquote forced labor better. 
So even though the way we define slave may be different, they share a common thread in that they're usually those deemed foreign and unworthy of autonomy by the ruling class. And this is such a common pattern that I could be talking about not only ancient times, but more recent times. For example, the US and European trading of enslaved Africans, Belgium and King Leopold's genocide of the Congo, the British genocide against the Aborigines, or the Japanese pillaging and rape of China, Korea, the Philippines, and Vietnam, and many more, and using their victims as quote-unquote comfort women. But even though these enslaved people are dubbed foreign and are given non-citizen status in order to keep them in place, many who are either forcibly brought to the colonizer's place of origin or who willingly go looking for better opportunities eventually come to call that place home, again, despite their outsider status. For a modern day example, the agricultural workers in the US who handpick our food and produce are mostly made up of non-citizens, but call the US their home, but because of their status, they're seen as unimportant to the government and to the larger public. FWD US reports that an estimated 73% of agricultural workers today were born outside of the US, and yet they're supporting a trillion dollar industry. Their personhood is devalued because of their foreign status, and that somehow justifies them paying them pennies, even though their work feeds the people who hate them. And today, under late stage capitalism, the global subjugation of the world's poor has increased tenfold. U.S. multi-billion dollar conglomerates outsource labor and exploit workers globally in basically every market imaginable. Whether it's in Bangladesh to make our clothes, Vietnam to make our shoes, China to make our phones, South Africans moderating Facebook, there's millions of laborers being paid slave wages to bring everything from clothes to refrigerators to nightstands to safe web pages into our homes. Through 18th and 19th century imperialism and colonization, the U.S. and other imperialist nations have molded the world into their image and now in the 20th and 21st century, have stratified the globe into the quote-unquote developed, the developing, and the underdeveloped world, or basically the imperialists and the imperialized. And through these mechanisms, the U.S. has at its disposal millions of impoverished people who have to weigh the options of not having food on the table to feed their family or working 20-hour shifts at a fast fashion factory. But it's important to remember that this labor exploitation of quote-unquote underdeveloped countries goes back to the 20th century and earlier. For example, in the 1920s, known anti-Semite Henry Ford had a rubber factory in the Amazon called Fogilandia in the state of Pará, Brazil, where he also tried to convert the indigenous people, but they revolted and were able to kick him out. S.C. Johnson, on the other hand, had better luck in the 1930s, where the now CEO's grandfather traveled to the state of Ceará, Brazil, to export the canaúba tree and the wax it produces, which was basically in every product of theirs at the time. As the S.C. Johnson website reads, The leaves from the canaúba palm are the source of the world's hardest wax, the key ingredient for nearly every S.C. Johnson product at the time. Demand for S.C. Johnson products was growing rapidly. If the company was going to survive, we would need a steady supply of the palm. As Sam Johnson explains in Kanauba, a son's memoir, it is the only thing that seemed to flourish in that particular kind of environment. All of the other plants and trees are destroyed in the alternate dry periods that they go through in the northeastern part of Brazil. But the palm does very well because it's the wax on the leaves that protects the life of the palm. The manual process used at the time to harvest canaúba wax involved shredding the palm leaves by whipping them across the stand embedded with knives, and then beating them to make the freed wax fall off. A person could process only 1,000 leaves a day, and about half the resulting powder was contaminated with debris. HF knew advances could be made. Oh, I wonder how those advances were made and who did all of that labor. But it wasn't until the latter half of the 20th century during the post-war era and during the early 21st century that internationally sourced labor became the norm. And in fact, in imperialist nations, the rise of outsourcing at the beginning of the 21st century was used as a source of cheap laughs, as seen in sitcoms like The Big Bang Theory about Indian call centers and in The Office about China. But the U.S. isn't the only power to blame, though they're one of the biggest. You can't be the world's fastest growing economy for years on end without taking some part in the exploitation of labor. 
There is also IKEA and their fast furniture, and also various Chinese companies exploiting workers in central southern African nations such as Zambia, Tanzania, and Mozambique. This area is well endowed with copper, iron, gold. Manganese and other base metals. According to the Institute of Developing Economics, China is almost exclusively reliant on Sub-Saharan Africa for its cobalt imports, and significantly reliant on manganese, the latter primarily from Gabon, South Africa, and Ghana. Cobalt is primarily used in lithium-ion batteries, which power our electronics, which are mostly made in China. According to Safeguard Global, China accounts for 28.7 percent of the global manufacturing output. And though I do think it's important to note how capitalist corporations from developing nations like China and other BRIC countries happily wear the hat of imperialist, it's also important to note that the poor in China, for instance, are also still being exploited, like their overseas Zambian and Tanzanian counterparts. But that also doesn't excuse rampant anti-black fueled violence at the hands of the Chinese, or their disregard for the local ecosystems. On the other hand, I also want to say that it's the U.S. and Western European powers that have made it so the only way for most countries to compete with them is through exploitative business practices. It's easy for countries like the U.S. to point the finger at China for exploiting workers and using child labor when they've already reaped the benefits of those practices. That doesn't excuse what Chinese corporations and manufacturers and governments are doing, but I do think that if we're going to point the finger around, we should at least not be hypocrites about it. Not to mention that it's sometimes the U.S. companies who knowingly exploit children and the poor overseas, not just outsourced middlemen bourgeois. And even though we'd like to live in a world where we could just turn our backs on this horrible system, it's almost impossible to do so, especially for people who live in poverty or are living on the edge of becoming impoverished and can't risk fighting against the hand that feeds them, which is of course what capitalists want: an overtired labor force that is too weak and weary to fight back against the real enemy, so they fight amongst themselves. Many people, in turn, believe that the only way to get ahead is to exploit those beneath them. Here in Brazil, for example, a known developing nation, the fast fashion scene is brutal. It's well known that domestic fast fashion retailers exploit immigrants and the poor to work in horrendous conditions where they're paid by the pieces they make, where they live at the place of employment, where they're not allowed to go outside, especially if they're immigrants and are undocumented. And the middlemen who exploit their underlings continue to hurt these people, even when they're exploited by their much wealthier bosses. The problem, at the end of the day, is that these middlemen aspire to be wealthy and look up to the rich, rather than finding solidarity with those beneath them. The corrupt chain of command makes it almost impossible to turn around and see the truth, because if you do, you're risking your entire livelihood. Until the global working class comes together and fights back against the capitalistic system that binds them, that forces people to exploit each other, people around the world will continue to fight, suffer, and resent each other. But it's also not up to us as individuals to tear down an entire system. It's only through organization, through understanding, through group action that change will occur. And workers are fighting back right now. For example, the writers and actors unions are fighting for job security and benefits, as Hollywood studios want to turn writing and acting into gig jobs, or wholly replace them with text-based prediction apps. In South Africa, Facebook moderators are unionizing as they're forced to go through millions of clips a day of traumatizing content, and are only paid fractions of cents per view, not for their valuable time. So now that we know about capitalism's long history and how today it's reached unimagined heights, now let's get into the infrastructure that has made global manufacturing and exploitation possible. Many of humanity's largest undertakings have only happened in the name of capital gain. The Suez Canal and Panama Canal are modern marvels of engineering, but were primarily built to help and expand capitalist empires. They exist solely to send goods more easily from developing nations to developed nations, or from imperialized nations to their imperialists. Construction of the Suez Canal began in 1859 and ended in 1869. It was funded by French diplomat Ferdinand de Lesp, who created the Suez Canal Company. The goal of the canal was to join the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, and thus connecting Europe to Asia and cutting down travel time. The Persian Gulf to the Northern European Range is particularly impacted by the Suez Canal. A 21,000-kilometer journey around Africa is reduced to a 12,000-kilometer journey, taking 14 days. Therefore, the Suez Canal saves between seven to ten days of shipping time, depending on the ship's speed. As for the canal's construction, 
Forced labor, also known as slavery or corvée work, temporary enslavement, was used for the initial manual work of excavation. The excavation took some ten years, with forced labor corvée being employed until 1864 to dig out the canal. Some sources estimate that over 30,000 people were working on the canal at any given period. More than 1.5 million people from various countries were employed, and that tens of thousands of laborers died, many of them from cholera and similar epidemics. In addition, company towns were used, where basically housing was only guaranteed if you remained employed. The Suez Canal sits in Egypt, but it was controlled by the UK and France until 1956. Following years of negotiation, the British withdrew their troops from the Suez Canal in 1956, effectively handing control over to the Egyptian government under the leadership of President Gamal Abdel Nasser. As for the Panama Canal, its construction began in 1904 and ended in 1914. The U.S. under Theodore Roosevelt came to an agreement with the Panamans and backed their secession from Colombia and recognized them as a sovereign nation. In return, they were able to come to an agreement and build a canal which sits at the isthmus of Panama, connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and effectively reduced ship travel time from the Atlantic to the Pacific by about five months and travel distance by some 8,000 miles. Lesp of the Suez Canal attempted to complete one in Panama, but workers were dying at high rates, over 200 a month, due to malaria and yellow fever, and so the construction came to a halt and he gave up. When the U.S. took over, Chief Engineer John Frank Stevens tried to create better working conditions, and workers from the U.S. and the Caribbean came and settled in the area. However, even after all that effort, about 5,600 workers died of disease and accidents during the U.S. construction phase of the canal. And with the help of these two enormous feats that used thousands of low-wage and exploited laborers, goods were able to be accessed more efficiently and used to line the pockets of corporate billionaires worldwide. And today, the global shipping industry continues to exploit its workers. These giant shipments of anything from foreign motor vehicles to single-use plastics arrive in gigantic shipping containers that then get unloaded and then driven by real people in trucks, mostly underpaid gig workers, to warehouses where they're handled again by underpaid gig workers who then sort them, and then they get passed again to underpaid delivery people to our doorstep. And online retailers have the audacity to offer one-day shipping. Note. I just want to clarify here that one day and same-day delivery, as well as single-use items, are very important, especially for disabled people. This isn't to say that these things shouldn't exist, but rather that we could lessen the carbon footprint and labor exploitation it takes to accomplish these tasks if we were able to be self-sustaining communities and produced and transported products domestically and paid and treated essential workers fairly. And though at first these engineering feats of capitalism, like the Suez Canal and giant ships carrying goods from around the world, seem cool, like globalization and the whole world working together, but it just ended up in labor exploitation, overconsumption, and a massive carbon footprint. According to Climate Change News Today, there are around 60,000 ships carrying 11 billion tons of cargo every year, around 80% of world trade, and these ships run on heavy fuel oil. This is the gunky black tar-like substance that comes out of the bottom of an oil refinery once all of the transparent road fuels like gasoline and diesel have been separated out. Heavy fuel oil contains up to 500 times as much cancer-causing sulfur dioxide than the legal maximum allowed in road fuels. In 2021, two of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, the low-lying Marshall Islands and Solomon Islands in the Pacific, earlier this month submitted a groundbreaking proposal to the UN's International Maritime Organization to apply a global carbon price of $100 per ton to the shipping industry to pay for its upgrade to cleaner zero carbon fuels. But they're fighting a losing battle against lobbyists being paid to weaken and prevent any environmental regulation. And in 2022, the global average was still six dollars per ton of CO2. Though there is a goal today to raise it to seventy-five dollars by 2030, which still isn't what the most vulnerable nations want. And the entire system is just so fragile. Like remember the Suez Canal incident, which caused a massive shortage in goods. That then affected the entire chain of command. Truckers in the U.S. were out of jobs because of the delay in shipments. It's such a delicate system when you can't provide for your own people because you'd rather exploit people overseas than abide by the labor laws of your own country. And honestly, even those labor protections are really flimsy. 
And I don't mean to romanticize the past. This isn't some sort of MAGA argument. I don't want to be misconstrued. But I do think that governments and corporations owe it to laborers to treat them fairly no matter where they're working or where they're from, but especially those living in nations that non-consensually have to take the brunt of pollution from wealthier nations. Trash exportation from rich countries to poor nations is rampant, and that's because what we buy is trash that isn't meant to last. It's meant to become trash so you buy more and continue to perpetuate this endless cycle of consumerism. Today, everything we have is fast. It's not just fast fashion, though that's one of the biggest culprits. It's also fast makeup and beauty products, fast furniture and home decor, where detail and character goes to die, fast appliances where it's cheaper to buy a new one than to repair it. Everything we buy is fast. I'm guessing the name fast, coined primarily by fast fashion, has the same thing to do with fast food. It's cheap, feels good in the moment, but then you're hungry again, and is made by underpaid and exploited workers. Not to mention, it's made of cheap and barely wearable materials, similar to how the fast food we eat is made of artificial ingredients. And the consequence of all of this isn't just poverty, but also, like we've talked about, imminent climate collapse. So for the rest of this video, I want to talk about fast fashion and fast furniture specifically, as well as how pricing is meaningless nowadays and how we can't even fix our own appliances. So without further ado, let's go. Fast fashion just keeps getting worse. So the shirt I'm wearing is actually from 2008. It's from an old retailer called Mandy. I don't know if you've heard of it. And it still honestly looks great and fits great. However, my fast fashion t-shirt from Zara that I got maybe two years ago is already faded, lost its shape, and is falling apart. So before we get into how fast fashion is today, let's take a look into the past and talk about a brief history of fast fashion. The possibility of mass producing garments started during the Industrial Revolution during the late 1800s with the invention of the powered textile machines such as the water frame and the spinning jenny as well as the cotton gin, the variable speed baton for an improved power loom, and the push pedal sewing machine. Where fashion used to be a laborious process that took months, sourcing materials, dyeing and treating fabric, and hand stitching, it suddenly took a few weeks or so to produce mass amounts of clothing. Before the Civil War, the raw materials were sourced primarily by enslaved Africans. Later in the 1870s to the turn of the century, those same people were forced to work for slave wages through sharecropping, and they would continue to source the cotton, wool, plants for dyeing, leather, and other raw materials to later send north. Six this morning to four o'clock this afternoon. That's right. How much did you earn? A dollar. One dollar? That's right. One dollar. The materials would be shipped north where children and immigrants in cities, the majority of whom were from Eastern Europe, put the raw materials together to make the final product. At the turn of the century, in the U.S. at least, the labor force who put together textiles and the end products was mainly composed of women and children who worked in horrendous and unsafe conditions. And these immigrants, mainly, again, who were women, were also mostly Jewish, and they formed one of the biggest uprisings of the time against big business. On November 23, 1909, more than 20,000 Yiddish-speaking immigrants, mostly young women in their teens and early 20s, launched an 11-week general strike in New York's shirtwaists industry. Dubbed the Uprising of 20,000, it was the largest strike by women to date in American history. The young strikers' courage, tenacity, and solidarity forced the predominantly male leadership in the needle trades and the American Foundation of Labor to revise their entrenched prejudices against organizing women. The strikers won only a portion of their demands, but the uprising sparked five years of revolt that transformed the garment industry into one of the best organized trades in the United States. Out of the associated waste and dress manufacturers, 353 firms, 339 contracts granting most demands, a 52-hour week, at least four holidays with pay per year, no discrimination against union loyalists, provision of tools and materials without fee, equal division of work during slack seasons, and negotiation of wages with employees. 
In March 25, 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory disaster in which 146 workers were killed due to the building not having proper exit or fire escapes sparked some labor reform, which was already again being fought for by working class immigrant and again mostly Jewish women, but now their fears were even more legitimized in the eyes of the public. As a result of the fire, the American Society of Safety Professionals was founded in New York City on October 14, 1911. The company's owners, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris, both Jewish immigrants who survived the fire by fleeing to the building's roof when it began, were indicted on charges of first- and second-degree manslaughter in mid-April. The pair's trial began on December 4, 1911. Harris and Blanc, after their acquittal, worked to rebuild their business, opening a factory at 16th Street and 5th Avenue. In the summer of 1913, Blank was once again arrested for locking the door in the factory during working hours. He was fined $20, which was the minimum amount of fine he could be charged. So though substantial gains were made, it became harder and harder to fight for workers' rights as the technological and manufacturing landscape changed and soon these jobs were moved overseas or underground where people of color and undocumented immigrants continued to make fast fashion clothes as they're threatened with being exposed if they were to fight back against their employer. But during the initial transition to fast fashion during the early 1900s, the old rich would still get their clothes tailored and fitted and choose the fabrics they'd like to wear. Fast fashion really only mattered to the bourgeois middle class, who could now participate in trends and styles that were once solely accessible to those at the very top. And this in turn made the rich want to hide their wealth. Showing it off became less in vogue now that it became so easily replicable. Plus, it's smart to hide your wealth and live in luxury quietly when you know you've made a fortune off exploited labor and shady business practices. Not to mention that the real flex of wealth is acting like you don't have any at all. You're so rich you don't need to be ostentatious or follow trends. Rather, you set them. And the middle class buying into fast fashion is extremely important because they keep capitalism in line as they associate with the upper class and have upper class aspirations and look down on the poor, even though they too are looked down on by the 1%. Suddenly, it became more readily available to the middle class to appear rich, to dress like the rich, or at least how they thought the rich would dress, and so they did. Fast fashion as it exists today was pioneered with the likes of Zara and H&M who were able to perfect quick response time to customers, who were able to vertically integrate, as well as bring high fashion to the masses by replicating runway looks and partnering with designer brands in an attempt to make their customers feel special and to give themselves legitimacy. For example, H&M partnered with Balenciaga for the spring 2022 season, but they've also partnered with the House of Mugler, Monchino, and Alexander Wong. Zara set themselves apart by making their customers feel special, feel like they're getting a fancier experience than just going to Forever 21 or H&M. With the store's ambiance, window displays, and minimalist logo, they make buyers feel like they're getting a rich person's experience, but also make them feel like they're getting their money's worth as their clothes are still affordable. But honestly, Zara's fashion is still fast fashion. They're just able to inflate their prices because the Zara brand carries a certain social capital to it people are willing to pay for the brand, similar to how Apple can charge more for their products simply because they're Apple. As for quick response manufacturing that Zara has perfected, it is used in fast fashion in order to bring down lead times or the start and end of an internal or external process. Basically, the goal is to decrease the time it takes to make a product and sell a product as much as possible. This includes making fashion trends shorter in order to sell more, and then in turn making products as fast as possible to get them from runway to retail in record time. And to do this, fast fashion brands, specifically Shein, not only exploit their workers, but also steal designs from small businesses and creatives because they ethically can't create enough unique designs with the short amount of turnaround time they've given themselves. So they plagiarize and copy and hope no one notices. Today, over 100 billion articles of clothing from fast fashion, underwear to evening dresses are produced annually by not only old hat fashion empires like Zara, but newer fast fashion online retailers like Shein, where all the garbage you could possibly want is only a click away. And as time went on, fast fashion retailers have become a staple in malls and websites in countries all over the world. It's no longer just a developed world that imports fast fashion and exploits international and domestic workers, but it also exists in developing countries like China and Brazil who have their own domestic fast fashion brands that produce cheap, 
garbage quality clothing and then sell them for double or triple what it costs to make them to the growing middle class consumers. However, recently in Brazil at least, the government has tried putting a large tariff on e-commerce sites like Shein and AliExpress in order to dissuade consumers from shopping abroad and encouraging shoppers to buy domestically. But the government's ruling didn't go over as planned. Previously, the government tried to end exemptions on all shipments as some companies imported products as individuals to avoid higher rates. After opposition from the public, the government decided to maintain their tax exemption up to 50 USD, but only for shipments made by individuals, stating that it would explore a digital tax collection model for companies. Economists predict that consumers will still buy overseas despite the tax. And though trying to curb Shein is always a good thing, it still doesn't address the fact that domestic fast fashion brands in Brazil specifically are still making garbage, overpricing it, and are also exploiting workers, specifically immigrants and other disadvantaged groups. Not to mention that the only reason people shop online and buy international is because things are just too expensive, even cheaply made things. But the solution isn't getting a less expensive option elsewhere that's just going to create a larger carbon footprint and continue to hurt laborers abroad, but rather stopping fast fashion altogether and returning to making quality, long-lasting products domestically under safe working conditions. Initially, fast fashion used to just be a name for the quick return time, for the amount of trends being pushed out each year. But now it's fast because the materials are just as shitty as the food in fast food. Not only is the labor cheap, the response time is impossible to meet ethically, but the materials are killing the planet. And they're not even strong enough to last a few months without becoming frayed, ripped, or misshapen. Fast fashion should disgust you. It should disgust you that there's a fast fashion landfill in the Atacama Desert. But it seems like nothing will stop these conglomerates as long as we, the consumers, keep buying. And though I think we should be conscious consumers, especially if you can afford not to participate in the system, I also think it's the governments who should be better at regulating these companies and also working to curb fast fashion domestically, where it's easier to regulate labor laws and exploitation. But when you can, look up the ethical ratings of fast fashion retailers, know what you're buying, and think twice before you buy something, especially if you're only going to wear it once. The Fashion Transparency Index 2023 is easily searchable, and it's also linked down below. So I saw a tweet the other day that was talking about how we don't have solid wood furniture anymore because trees don't grow as big as they used to. They're not given the time to mature and age, and that's why most of our wood furniture today is shitty, and that's really true. Hullworks, a company that works on restoring old wooden window frames, notes, The difference between old growth and new growth wood is like the difference between granite and paper. Old growth wood has better stability, durability, and longevity. New growth wood begins to rot and warp after only 20 years. The value of virgin growth wood is that it has grown very slowly over a long period of time. Because of the slow growth, the growth rings are very tight. Tight growth means more stability. In this photo, there are two pieces of wood 100 years apart. The wood from 1918 has 20 to 25 growth rings per inch. The wood from 2018 has only seven. The value of old growth lumber is the reason we should not throw out old windows. These old windows are structurally superior and can be restored instead of replaced. An old window will last another 100 years if properly cared for. It's true, they don't make them like they used to. And the reason why they don't make them like they used to is because we've cut down a lot of virgin forests in the name of progress, at least here in the US. Before the colonists arrived, the United States had about 1 billion acres of forests, which covered about half the country, including Alaska. In the time since 1600, it would be reduced by about 286 million acres, an area roughly the size of Colombia, converted to mostly agricultural use. And the world still deforests 15 billion trees every year. So in order to remedy this problem, we've created a newer problem, vast furniture. Rather than reuse and restore older wood furniture, we've turned to non-sustainable materials like plastic and new faux wood. 
In fact, some places have engineered trees to grow faster just to cut them down as soon as they're viable to make furniture to be sold for a quick buck. And though this may reduce the reliance on old growth forests, the new wood, like I've mentioned before, is cheap and brittle and the system just fuels rampant consumerism. In addition, formaldehyde is present in synthetic glues and adhesives that make wood chips and sawdust stick together in all sorts of fast furniture. Formaldehyde may also be used as a preservative in the paintings and coatings applied to these products. Fast furniture containing urea formaldehyde resins are the worst emitters. Today, most of our wood furniture is just made up of thinly sliced wood glued and pressed together with an imitation sticker on top. What we're buying is just really cheap paper mache quality wood that won't last more than a few years, let alone generations. I know some people who have collected furniture from their grandparents that are more than 100 years old that are still in good shape and that can't compete with the crap we're pushing out today and calling furniture. But millions of people want aesthetic, nice looking furniture and they want it now in order to show off their beautiful aesthetic apartments online. Many don't want to wait nor have the patience to collect valuable pieces. However, more people than ever are starting to save older pieces of furniture or look up older furniture on online marketplace like Facebook and Craigslist to buy and restore and keep hopefully forever. Before rampant consumerism and mass production, the furniture you bought would be for life. But then the post-war economic boom in allied nations meant that even furniture had to be up to date and stylish and trends would change at an impossible pace to keep people buying, to make people feel insecure if they didn't buy and conform. And I get it, we all want to furnish our homes with nice furniture or at least nice looking furniture. And it's sad that the only price accessible furniture to a lot of us is sourced unethically. I'm not here to blame us as consumers, but the big furniture companies like Ikea and Wayfair who profit off the fact that the majority of people can't afford quality, long-lasting products anymore. I also think that because the majority of us can't afford nice-looking furniture and quality home decor, that it makes what we can afford and what we're obligated to buy really ugly. Like kind of how fast fashion is really ugly because it's impossible to create beauty when you're under such a tenuous time constraint. And I know minimalism is a style and some people really like it, but now it just seems as though we're almost forced into liking it because that's all we can afford. We can only afford cheap, ugly laminate flooring, white paint, industrialized shelving and accent pieces, and faux wood furniture. We can't afford furniture with character or are afraid to buy something that won't be trendy in a few years. And so what's passed on to the masses is the most characterless and featureless furniture because it's the cheapest to produce and the least offensive to most buyers. This type of decor and furniture has nothing to say. It has no personality and that's by design. And again, some people genuinely like this style and it it's a design choice, but many of us don't have a choice. This is what's available, so that's what we have to furnish our homes with, even if we find it ugly. Again, there's marketplace and antiquing, and that does seem to be on the rise, which is good. People are starting to reject minimalism and embrace unique design elements again. But the majority of us don't have time to look for really good quality pieces of furniture and it's unfortunately just easier to buy what's ever on Amazon. Corporations have made it that way so they stay in business, so we're too tired at the end of the day and on weekends to dedicate time to finding and recycling and restoring older pieces, so we just buy new. The next industry I want to talk about is the home appliance industry. Here I'm talking about kitchen appliances like fridges, stoves, microwaves, dishwashers, electric kettles, but also washing machines and vacuums, etc. They're usually made by companies like Frigidaire, Whirlpool, GE, Samsung, LG, etc. Basically, like we've mentioned before, most of these things are assembled overseas and shipped to where we are or are produced domestically but then impossible to fix or even more expensive to fix than just buying a new one. Most dishwashers sold in the U.S. are made in the U.S. Whirlpool, Maytag, Amana, KitchenAid, and Ikea dishwashers are made at the world's largest dishwasher factory, located in Finlay, Ohio. However, when it comes to repair, it's almost impossible to do so as parts are meant to become obsolete within a few years. It's extremely difficult to estimate the reliability of an individual model. 
Brands use multiple factories and suppliers for single product lines. So a Kenmore oven from 2008 may have been built in a totally different factory and potentially a totally different country than one produced in 2015. Individual product components are sourced from multiple suppliers over time. So a dishwasher built in 2009 may have a different pump than the same model built in 2013. Just-in-time manufacturing in the appliance industry forces the consumer to get a new one. No wonder the typical warranty period for appliances is a mere one or two years. Everything you have today is made to break within a few years, so you keep buying, so you keep perpetuating this endless cycle of consumerism. In my family home as a kid, we had rotary phones because they still worked. I grew up using rotary phones. And we also had a fridge from the 80s up until the early 2000s when we got a new LG one, which ended up breaking in like five years. At least we're getting what we're paying for. If it costs you a full paycheck to buy a new appliance in 1981, an equivalent model today would only cost you a third of your paycheck today. And though it's great that we're able to buy cheaper appliances, it's not great that you have to keep buying them no matter what. This isn't to romanticize the past as there are some quality products out there today that are made to last, but back then even if things didn't last, you could at least repair them or attempt to repair them. But now, because they're built to become obsolete and because the majority of our products are made thousands of miles away, who will come to fix it? Where would you even go to buy a spare part that they don't even make anymore? How long will it take to get to you? How long can you go without a fridge? Is it even worth it? Recently, I wanted to fix my electric kettle, which broke after six months, but the spare part that I wanted was going to take like over a week to come. And with shipping, it cost even more than just buying a new one, so that's what I did. I bought a new one and I hate it. I also hate how a $100 electric kettle is basically the same as a $70 one. Like what do prices even mean anymore? They break at the same rate. You think that you're paying for quality, but you're not. Nowadays, only if you spend an astronomical amount of money on something are you guaranteed that it'll last at least a decade. But honestly, even that's not guaranteed anymore. What's the difference between a $20 mouse and a $45 mouse? Literally nothing. <laughs> They're gonna break at the same time. They're both going to be shitty. But in your head, you think that if you spend a little bit more money, maybe there's more of a guarantee in quality and longevity, but that's just not the case anymore. And I don't even know if it ever was. Al McGill of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business said in 2014, once consumers have a perception of the link between quality and price, it's hard to shake it. If they learn that quality is consistently high at high prices, they will assume low price options are worse, even when they aren't. We find the reverse also. If they learn that quality is consistently low at low prices, they may assume quality is consistently high at high prices, when that might not be the case. In some categories, some of the more expensive items might be great, but some not so great. Spending more doesn't guarantee shit, and that really fucks with my head. In all, if something breaks, good luck fixing it. Even though there are helpful tutorials online to fix anything you could imagine, fixing and repairing is really a skill set that we've lost because physically, it's hard to buy pieces to learn how to repair the appliances we have in the first place. Because we in the past few decades have been forced to buy new, the knowledge of how to repair something has dwindled. And this lack of repairability affects people who are living at or below the poverty line and can't always buy new. Survival depends on having the ability to repair things and the longevity of their belongings. For people who can't afford to buy new, having long-lasting products means having extra money for emergencies or being able to save for groceries that week. But it seems as though corporations just want to kill off poor people and make their newer products impossible to fix on purpose so only those with money can have access to them. When I was in high school, I took two years of sewing class. I went to a sewing summer camp where I learned how to hand sew, how to use a sewing machine and a finishing machine, as well as learned how to use patterns and crochet. Now, as an adult, I barely remember what I learned. Up until very recently, most people had their clothes tailored or knew how to tailor their clothes at home or had a seamstress in the family. Someone you knew knew how to make dress patterns or fix a hole in a sock. 
And I honestly think that today that knowledge is in the process of being lost. I grew up with people, primarily women, who sewed their own clothes, who knew how to dress mannequins, etc. But I can sadly say, as an adult who's 28 years old, I don't even know how to hem my own pants, even though my grandma and my mom pushed me to learn how to sew and even to embroider. Though we have classes in high school that teach us how to sew, how to cook, and how to work with wood, it's not enough and doesn't stick with us in this new world that we're living in because we grow up thinking we don't need those skills. Where we grow up with being purposely dissuaded from being self-sustainable because that would mean turning our backs and our wallets on billion-dollar corporations. I really am a believer in bringing back apprenticeships, learning new skills from childhood, whether that be painting, sewing, embroidery, cooking, weaving, carpentry, metalsmithing, the list goes on. I see a lot of reels on Instagram about bringing back like the homestead life of being a self-sustaining farm family. And though I think that movement is really problematic as homesteading brought about indigenous genocide and rugged individualism, and now you're doing it to be quirky on Instagram by channeling your inner Kirsten doll, I do think that we need to start becoming self-sustaining communities again. We need to learn how to grow our own food, to make our own clothes, to learn how to repair things and make things. And not just make things, but make them last. And I don't mean like we have to be like the Amish. And honestly, I don't think, you know, we should look up to those people. But rather, we can integrate modern society and tools while also creating an environmentally sustainable and less capitalistic environment. As the Nera said, it's not easy to see something that's never been before. And before we get to the conclusion of this video, I just want to go back to my beginning point about the history of global labor exploitation and talk about reverse outsourcing, which was featured in the documentary American Factory that I personally love revisiting. However, I will not be mentioning the documentary that features this story as Netflix workers where the documentary is hosted are on strike. So Fuyao Glass is a Chinese-owned corporation founded by billionaire Cao De Wang. As of 2023, he's worth 3.2 billion USD. Fuyao employs not only Chinese workers, but in 2016 opened up a plant in Ohio, which used to be a GM plant that closed down in 2008. Fuyao employs 2,000 people there who are both American as well as Chinese immigrant workers who worked for Fuyao in China and relocated to the U.S., Fuya manufactures glass for cars, and it's physically demanding labor that's also extremely dangerous. Workers not only handle volatile materials like glass, but also have to heat it under extremely high temperatures. In Ohio, throughout 2015 to 2017, during the transition period, tensions were high. Chinese business and culture is vastly different from American work culture. The documentary American Factory goes into more detail, but essentially the Chinese workers are seemingly okay with very poor working conditions, while the American workers are not. The Chinese are less demanding and more loyal to the company, while the American workers can be viewed as more entitled in comparison. And though some may say that the Chinese workers are brainwashed and don't know any better, but in fact, they do know their place in the hierarchy and they know that it's not in their immediate best interest to fight back. In China specifically, there are so many laborers in need of work that they soon become replaceable and thus will exploit themselves in order to have a sense of job security. The U.S. workers decided to vote to unionize their jobs to the CEO and higher-ups dismay, but not all of them were on board. Some of the U.S. employees, like the Chinese workers, were so desperate for money that they had to vote against their own interests. They didn't have the financial cushion to fight back, so they took the $1 raise. In March of 2018, Fuya forklift operator Ricky Patterson, 57, of Dayton, Ohio, died after he was trapped between his forklift and a pallet holding more than 2,000 pounds of glass, according to Marine police. People are being killed on the job, and yet we continue to just see this as a burden of progress, a necessary evil to keep the economy going. And that's the reality of many people's lives. Many people can't afford to strike or unionize, and that's what corporations want. But all workers around the world are entitled to their fair share, deserve benefits and job security and safety, and shouldn't have to exploit themselves to make a living. I think the most interesting thing about the Fuyao 
case is that it's like reverse outsourcing. Like the US has outsourced so many jobs specifically to China, and now here's a Chinese company coming to the US. Here comes a developing nation ready to exploit the so-called developed one. Oh, how the tables have turned, how the mighty have fallen. But in the end, it's not so different. There's still billionaires exploiting the working class, except these workers are American. And as such, they believe they should be treated better, especially since they come from the best country in the world. And even though American entitlement can be really annoying and dangerous, I think here it actually could be useful. We should all believe we are entitled to be treated fairly. We should all grow up and see the value our time and labor has. But honestly, sometimes even though we know how important we are, it can seem impossible to fight against large corporations who have all the money and resources in the world and who have a huge labor force to pick from. Which is why we shouldn't blame individuals for choosing to work under horrible conditions because in the end, they're well aware of the position they're in. From ancient times to the Industrial Revolution to the post-war era to now, human suffering and labor exploitation alongside mass bourgeois consumer consumption has made the rich richer than they've ever been. It seems as though no amount of thrifting or buying vintage or furniture restoration and upcycling will save us from the Earth's eventual collapse as we crumble under late-stage capitalism. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to form good consumerist habits, support striking workers, and unionize when possible. Even though companies will continue to turn their backs to try to find shortcuts with the help of technology and AI to replace human workers, it is still worth fighting back because technology will never fully replace what humans have to offer. Humans don't create art and fashion and furniture and home decor simply for its function, simply to make money but because we seek to create beauty to find truth to find meaning. And no amount of replicated stolen art and design will change that. So continue to look up where you're buying from, try to find local small businesses in your area to support, save that rented furniture on Marketplace, learn to restore and repair your favorite items and appliances when possible. And even though in the end, governments and multi-billion dollar corporations are the ones with the biggest carbon footprint and exploiting the labor of the masses, they sometimes forget that there's power in numbers, there's power in solidarity, and that many can win against the few. So that's it for this one. I know it was kind of a bummer and a downer, but you know, topics like, the, like these are downers and that's okay. We need to be okay with being uncomfortable sometimes in order to realize, you know, how effed up the world we li we're living in is and to feel motivated to go out and do something about it. So, you know, that's the point of this video. So that's it for this one. If you liked it, please go and support me on Patreon. The link will be here. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Stop buying fast fashion. Okay, bye.